Peter Lombard and the Sacramental System, excerpt by Elizabeth Francis Rogers, 1892-1974, published in 1917. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Peter Lombard and His Textbook Introduction Manuals which gather knowledge or opinion and present it in orderly form often live longer and sometimes seem to exert an influence far exceeding the works of original genius. Donatus wrote in his Ars Grammatica the rules of composition devised by many, which he alone collected and ordered for common instruction. He had deserved fame as a teacher, to whom Jerome went as a pupil, but the Ars Grammatica became the school book of the Middle Ages, was still in use at the Reformation, while its author's name became a common metonymy in the form donut for a rudimentary treatise of any sort still greater has been the vogue of euclid who in the third century before the christian era produced his elements which in varied forms are still books of instruction for youth in the science of geometry similar to the role played by these two is that of the greatest theological textbook of the middle ages to whose author we have at last come. The Life of Peter Lombard Peter Lombard, the master of the sentences, was born in Lumello, not far from the Novara, which then belonged to Lombardy, probably about 1100. His family, both poor and obscure, was unable to educate the son, and there was small hope for a career in the church until he found a patron in the bishop of Lucca who sent him to school at Bologna. The success in his studies achieved there made him wish to go to France, and in this desire again his patron helped him with a letter of recommendation to St. Bernard, abbot of Clairvaux. Bernard at first placed him in the Episcopal School at Reims, which then enjoyed a great reputation under the headship of Le Toff, where he remained but a short time. Paris was really the center of the intellectual movement of the day, and it is therefore not surprising that Peter wished to go thither. Bernard, who had provided for his needs at Reims, now wrote, recommending him to Gildun, abbot of St. Victor, for the short stay which he intended to make in Paris. The school of St. Victor was at that time famous for its learning. It was to this abbey that William of Campo had retired in 1108, and with him had come many of his pupils. William was made Bishop of Chalons in 1113, but his successor, Gilduin, elected abbot the following year, maintained the tradition of piety and learning, and to the school came students from all over Europe, of whom perhaps the most famous was Hugh of Blankenburg, better known as Hugh of St. Victor. The Lombard probably came to Paris before 1139, just as Abelard had resumed his career as a teacher there. Probably Peter Lombard heard his lectures, at least he read his books, for John of Cornwall tells us that he frequently had his book in his hands. He also studied Gratian's Decretum, which had just been finished, and it was precisely these two influences, Abelard and Gratian, which most conditioned his later method of exposition. He soon gained the chair of theology at the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, which he filled for many years, and in which he won great and enduring repute. By 1142, his commentary on the epistles of St. Paul had become known. In 1148, he was at Reims with Robert of Moulin, 
and joined Adam du Petit Pont and Hugh of Reading as opponents of Gilbert de la Porre in theological discussions. He is already well enough known to be consulted by Pope Eugenie the Third, and no greater evidence of the regard in which he was now held could be found. Sometime during the years 1148-1150 he was at Rome, probably on account of the troubles arising in the Paris schools. While there he became acquainted with the work of John of Damascus, the Fountain of Knowledge, which had just been translated by Burgundio of Pisa. This again shows us his interest in the latest publications. His own fertility of mind was matched with a desire to know the thoughts of others. At the beginning of 1152, when his successful teaching at Paris had made his reputation, and when his Libre Sententiarum had just been finished, a bull of Eugene III gave him a prebend in the Diocese of Beauvoir, again on the recommendation of Bernard of Clairvaux. His teaching had been opposed in some points by Robert of Malun and Maurice of Sully, but Peter endeavored always to keep it orthodox, though taking account of all the opinions of the day. He was always circumspect, always deferential to authority, and a friend of peace. His instruction, despite this opposition, was successful and his pupils, realizing the merit of his lectures, begged him to publish them. To this request we owe the celebrated Book of Sentences. In 1159, the bishopric of Paris was vacant by the death of Thilbault. Philip of France, fourth brother of King Louis the Seventh and Archdeacon of Paris, was elected to succeed him. He declined but advised the canons to elect Peter Lombard, whose pupil he had been, and whose talents and services fitted him for this dignity. Later in the century, Walter of St. Victor accused him of gaining the election by simony, but there seems to have been no just ground for this accusation. In July 1160, Peter was succeeded in the bishopric by Maurice de Soli, a master in theology, and the builder of the present Cathedral of Notre Dame. Peter died some time after. The date is not known, but it cannot have been later than 1164. In the Cartulary of Paris we find his name mentioned a couple of times. The house in which he had lived was given to the Church of Paris, and Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury presented the original manuscript of the sentences to the cathedral library for the benefit of poor students. It is most surprising that a man whose book has been so widely known should be mentioned so seldom by contemporary historians. The Lombard's Earlier Works from the earlier period of Peter Lombard's life, three works have come down to us, the Commentary on the Psalms of David and the Commentary on the Epistles of St. Paul and his sermons. For the study of the scriptures, the Middle Ages had a number of collections of the comments of the fathers on the several books of the Bible. In the Lombard's time, the most celebrated was that of Wilfred Strabo, known as the Glossa Ordinaria, written in the ninth century. At the beginning of the 12th century, Anselm of Leon added new notes to this between the lines, and his work was known as the Glossa Interlinearis. Peter Lombard simply used this Glossa and composed his commentary almost entirely of citations from Augustine, Cassiodorus, the Glossa of Alsuin, Rabanus, Morris, and others, which were included in the Glossa. Following their example, he does not entirely give up the literal sense of the passage, but always inclines rather to the spiritual and mystical interpretation. His commentary on St. Paul's Epistles was written about 1140, 
like that on the Psalms, it is hardly more than a compilation of extracts from the writings of Ambrose, Hilary, Jerome, Augustine, Cassiodorus, and Remy of Auxerre. The Lombard's sermons are hard to date. Some are probably from the time of his episcopate, others certainly seem to be from the period of his residence with the canons of St. Victor. Their pulpit was famous, and Peter must have preached there. The sermons are still unpublished. Some of the sermons are said to be inferior in style to that of the books of the sentences, and would therefore lead us to believe that they were from an earlier period. Some also show quite strikingly the influence of the strong mysticism of St. Victor. The Four Books of Sentences The book on which Peter Lombard's fame rests, and from which he gained his title of Master of Sentences, was a Libri Quator Sententiarum. This was probably written about 1150, this date seems to fit with the few facts that we know about his life, and with his use of Gratian's Decretum and John of Damascus's Fountain of Knowledge, which Peter himself tells us had been translated by order of Pope Eugene the Third from the Greek into Latin. In the prologue to the sentences, Peter Lombard declares that he has gathered the opinions of the fathers into one volume that the students may be saved the handling of a number of books. He makes no pretense to originality. The Middle Age was a period of codification in all branches of knowledge, and the Lombard follows a long line of canonists and theologians who had devoted themselves to gathering and codifying the opinions of the fathers and doctors of the church on question of doctrine. In the first half of the 12th century, this parallel development of canon law and theology was summed up in two great textbooks, Gratian's Decretum or Concordia Discordantium Canonum, and Peter Lombard's Libre Quartor Sententiarum. The legend that made Peter and Gratian brothers is untrue, but it is at least an interesting exposition of the comparison that the Middle Ages always drew between their two books. Up to the 12th century there had been no textbook for the study of theology. It is certainly interesting, then, to see how the Lombard systematized the theological teaching of the Middle Ages into a compendium which became the basis of the instruction in the schools and universities for centuries and the starting point for the work of all Catholic theologians. In this task, Peter Lombard owed much to the work of his predecessors, and especially to the books of his contemporaries, which appeared a few years before his own. There are only about ten lines in the whole book for which no source can be found. Abelard had already led the way in the systematizing of theology by his Theologia, and we can see the widespread influence of this in several books. The Sentences of Peter Abelard, or the Epitome, as it is usually erroneously called, a collection of Abelard's opinions made by some of his pupils. The Sentences of Roland Bardinelli, later Pope Alexander II of Omnibini, and most important of all, those of Peter Lombard. For his method, the Lombard was more dependent on the model of Abelard's Sic et Non, the gathering of authorities in a systematic, methodical way, for and against a doctrine. But unlike Abelard, he makes some attempt at reconciling the differences between his authorities by subtle distinctions and clever inferences. Peter states the proposition, quotes the authorities on the subject, which are often quite contradictory, and ends with a few words which show the true conclusion as he sees it. He is always timid, 
always modest, and some of his conclusions are intentionally stated quite vaguely. His humility and modesty are summed up admirably in the rather discouraged words at the end of one distinction. If anyone can explain this better, I am not envious. In the arrangement of his book, he does not follow Abelard's Theologia that was divided under the headings Faith, Charity, and Sacrament. Peter Lombard's division into four books was perhaps taken from John of Damascus's Fountain of Knowledge, which he followed quite closely in the first three books. In the prologue, he says that he will divide the books into chapters with titles, what is sought may be found more easily. In this arrangement he was influenced by the decretum. Later, in the next century, it was divided into distinctions. The patristic authorities which the Lombard cites in defense of every point in his arguments he found mostly in the sick et non and in Gratian's decretum. It is probable that the gathering of many of the quotations from the fathers in the sick et non was the fruit of Abelard's own reading, but certainly there were others in that period who were working at the same task. Alger of Liege had also put together texts from patristic writings in his sentences, which were an aid to Peter Lombard's work and some of which were incorporated in Gratian's Decretum. The frequently repeated phrase, we are often asked, shows that Peter was considering all the questions and opinions of his age on the points in question and attempting to harmonize them. On the whole, he succeeds in remaining rigorously orthodox but there was opposition to some of his views during his lifetime and after. The Third Council of the Lateran in 1179, however, began one canon with, We believe with Peter Abelard. In the 13th century, the masters of Paris condemned several propositions, which have since been published at the end of the book. The Lombard's rather vaguely stated conclusions were an advantage to the book when used as a text in the schools, for it encouraged questions and comments on it by both masters and students. The first book of the sentences discusses the Trinity, the second, the creation and the fall, the third, the incarnation, and the last, the sacraments and eschatology. It is, of course, his discussion of sacraments which here concern us. Here much work had already been done by the theologians of the period, and Peter entered into their labors. In his sentences, Robert Pullis, the first English cardinal, had given four of his eight books to a discussion of the sacraments, but his work was not systematically arranged and a very slight comparison with Peter's shows what an advance the latter had made. His advance, however, was only possible by the help of the cardinal's work. In the Theologia of Abelard, as in the books of sentences by his followers, the sacraments had been discussed at length. In the Sic et Non, too, questions relating to the sacraments had been raised and both these had a marked influence on Peter's fourth book. Hugh of St. Victor's last work before his death in 1141 was De Sacramentis Fidei. Much of this had been taken over, word for word, by the Summa Sententiarum, which quite certainly was not by Hugh, but comes from his school. Originally, it had no tractates on the last things, on orders, or on marriage. The tractate on orders was taken from Ivo of Chartres, that on marriage from Walter of Martigues, but these had been added to the other tractates before the Lombard study of the books, for he made use of them both. Fournier has made it certain that Gratian's Decretum was written before Peter Lombard's sentences, 
and it is then quite clear that it was one of the sources for Peter's discussion of the sacraments. From the Decretum and from Abelard's Secat Non, Peter took the citations from patristic literature as authorities for his argument. The Lombard transcribes literally passages from Hughes' De Sacramentis, or from the Summa, and adds citations of authorities which he took from Gratian. Today such methods would lay him open immediately to the charge of plagiarism, but in the Middle Ages this was a correct literary method. Passages from the Fathers are given under their own names, at least to the best of his knowledge of them, but those from works of his contemporaries quite anonymously. End of Peter Lombard and the Sacramental System Excerpt by Elizabeth Francis Rogers, 1892-1974 Published in 1917